Hey everybody, uh, you are going to love this one today. You know, for a change, and, and let me tell you why. My guest is Edward Isaac Devere. He covers politics for the Atlantic Monthly. He's written a book, Battle for the Soul, Inside the Democratic Campaigns to Defeat Trump. And it chronicles all the different Democratic uh, candidates' campaigns in their fight for the nomination in 2020. And then, uh, of course, uh, follows the Trump-Biden uh, race as well, all the way past the election and, uh, t uh, and that debacle, at, uh, the insurrection at the, at the Capitol, etc. This one is candy. If you are at all a political junkie, you are just going to love this. A lot of inside dope, a lot of great stories. It's like, this is like eating your favorite candy for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, except every bite is like the first bite of it. It's, it's just, you're going to, I'm telling you, you are going to love, love, love this one. You know for a change. Richard Ben Kramer mm -hmm. wrote What It Takes, right? Now, I'm sure you've read that book, right? Yeah, sort of required reading for a political reporter. <laughs> yeah, and of course, he did a very different thing. This reads very much like a book. This is a book. This is not, you know... Um, this article from this day, this article from this right. day, this article from this day. This is a, you you uh, put this together as a book. But it, this is partly the work product of covering this campaign for the whole time. Yeah, I uh, signed the contract to write this book in the summer of 2018 uh, with the thought that it was going to be a pretty important and crazy election. Uh, obviously not anticipating. Oh, too bad that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, the, the, the proposal in 2018 says this is going to be uh, the most important election and craziest election of our time. And I think it also said the, the most crowded Democratic field. Uh, and at that point, it I was, was anticipating like uh, maybe 16 candidates. Uh, and then I started working at The Atlantic at the very beginning of October of 2018. And so when I went to The Atlantic to cover the campaign, I knew I would be writing the book. There are some things that showed up in articles along the way that are in the book, but I basically went back and re-reported everything and anything that, that was in an article. I essentially pulled it apart and put it back together with more facts in it. So uh, it is not like, th there's not more than maybe uh, a quote or two that exist in both. I see, I see. So what were you writing for The Atlantic while you were doing this? I was writing the day-to-day -day coverage of the campaign. Uh, oh, which, you were? Okay, uh, w Which covered a lot of the same stuff, but obviously there are things, for example, there was a lot more day-to-day -day coverage, at least it's <laughs> at the early part of the race, about Beto O'Rourke than there is of him in the book, right? Uh, the, yeah, when, he sort uh, of flamed, <laughs> flamed out a little bit uh, early. Um, yeah, uh, and yeah, and a few of them did. Look, you you you've been through this, right? Uh, there there's what sort of makes sense as mattering day to day, week to week, and then when you take a step back and you say, did any of that stuff <laughs> actually make a difference in in what happened in the campaign? And and so there were huge chunks of things that I just uh, didn't pay attention to in the book because ultimately they didn't add up to much. In retrospect, I I think that. People really were not giving Biden a chance until South Carolina, except that you kind of had to think, hmm, it's kind of obvious that he was going to win South Carolina. Right. <laughs> uh, but uh, I almost think especially because uh, it looked like Bernie was going to be the nominee if he didn't. I think that's right. I went back and I looked at an article that I wrote. It must have been uh, right around this time in twenty. 
2015, when there was the thought that Biden was going to run in the 2016 race. And uh, I was a Politico at the time, and I kind of made fun of the idea that Biden's people were saying that it didn't matter what happened in the first couple of primaries, he could win South Carolina and slingshot into the presidency or into the nomination. Right. (laughs) You know, there was always this thought, and I think you're right. If you look at the way things were coming together in the 2020 race, he was always going to win there. The question was about what the rest of the field would look like and how big his win would have been, right? If he had won with 25, 30% of the vote, everything that happens after that looks very different from uh, what what ended up happening when he won with about 50% of the vote. And I think, if I'm not wrong, first of all, uh, the black people of South Carolina saved the Democratic Party's ass, Is that fair to say? I mean, if you subscribe to the idea that Joe Biden is the person who could have beaten Donald Trump and the rest of the candidates in the field probably couldn't have. And I think there's good reason to think that. There's certainly incontrovertible reason to say that the coalition that Biden put together would not have been possible with any of the other candidates. Maybe some of the others could have won. Bernie Sanders thinks he would have beaten Trump anyway. Uh, he and his inner circle are among the few who who believe that. Uh, but so if if that's what you think, then then yeah, it's black people in South Carolina who saved it. Well, let's start with Bernie uh, because uh, you start off in the book very early, start talking about single payer, mm-hmm. right? And my feeling was that watching the debates and when there were 10 in like every debate, for a while, you, you you were having debates where people had a minute to answer, and it felt to me like pretty much every candidate had uh, advisors, uh, consultants who gave them a minute 20 answer that they said as fast as they could so they could say it in a minute 10, <laughs> and then it took 10 extra seconds, and that that was every damn answer, unless you were Yang, who um, basically talk like a human being, which is why people liked him. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, 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 and But everybody else, it was exhausting to watch. It was exhausting right? for me to being paid to be there you know, and watch it. I couldn't make sense. Yeah, you were getting money <laughs> at least, and that was your job, and it still is exhausting. I, sometimes your job is exhausting, but it was exhausting because every answer was crammed with consultant speak and was just mind numbing at a certain point. Now here's here's something that I was driving me nuts, uh, which was single payer. Because in in 2018, we picked up 41, right? 41 mm-hmm. seats. When you pick up seats, you pick up Republican seats, purple districts, right? Yep. So who are those people who, why, and why did they vote? Well, they did that because they finally saw what the Affordable Care Act was when Trump tried to, and the Republicans in Congress tried to get rid of it. And also they saw that the Republicans had nothing. Weren't you, were you surprised at how, what they had was nothing? You go back and uh, Josh Holmes, who was a strategist for McConnell, tweeted a couple of years ago his original notes uh, from when Obamacare was first passed that coined that they were going to say repeal and replace. And it became this joke. OK, they couldn't repeal it and they never came up with the replacement. I think it was amazing when they actually got to the point, the beginning of 2017, of having the House and the Senate and, of course, Trump in the White House and moving on repealing it, that A, even then they couldn't repeal it, and B, that they never, ever came up with a replacement. It it really is one of these stunning things in politics. I don't know. You know, Obama would always say, if you've got a better plan to do all this, then I'm open to it. But this is the plan we came up with. So until you have something else, this is all we've got. I'm not sure Obama's right. I'm not a healthcare expert. But it's strange that so much time would have gone on. It's 10 years. And the Republicans have come up with no even basic plan of what it is. I'm not a healthcare expert, but I went through the process of, you know, crafting that thing with everybody. I got there a little bit late. I was the 60th vote, by the way. Arlen Specter wasn't the 60th vote. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which you which you write. I was the sixth. That, that's fair. That that's true. 
Okay. Um, I, I'm going to correct that for the paperback. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> but I, I have to tell you a funny Arlen story. So Baucus was trying to get this bipartisan deal done, right? And he had this gang of six with three Republicans, which was Grassley, Snow, and Enzi. And he would come to the caucus lunch and just report on the progress or lack of progress or the reverse of progress. <laughs> and But he kept thinking we were going to get a bipartisan deal. And this went on for two and a half months. Finally, one day after we're waiting and waiting and waiting for come this bipartisan, and he shows up and he finally goes, well, I've concluded that they never had any intention <laughs> of doing a bipartisan deal. And Arlen Specter says, well, I could have told you that. <laughs> And I said to Arlen, then why didn't you? <laughs> and what did he say to that? Said, he just ignored me, <laughs> which was a lot of what Arlen would do to people. But it, it's amazing. But this brings me to the campaign, which is you write about Sanders basically getting all the liberals who are intending to run for president to sign on to single payer, right? Yep. Except I don't think Klobuchar did, right? She, well, and if we're counting all the senators who ran for president, Michael Bennett didn't either. But neither okay. Bennett was not planning to run at that point. I also think he never would have signed on. And it, Klobuchar was like sort of thinking about running, but it wasn't a very serious, it wasn't as serious as the others. For example, Kamala Harris, who was gung-ho. I was going nuts at these early debates because they're spending, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes on single payer. And I'm watching this and I'm going like, this is crazy. Because we won those 41 purple districts because those people saw what the ACA was and liked it. Yep. And they liked that their pre-existing conditions were covered. They, they saw that health care was complicated as... Trump he said, who knew it was complicated? <laughs> well, everybody knew it was complicated, you idiot. But anyway, so the the suburban women who voted for uh, Democrats and flipped the, the House and got us 41 seats, they didn't want single payer. Those people liked their health care because their employer or their husband's employer paid for it. Right. And so they were getting free <laughs> or 80% of their health care paid for. And it was, and I'm watching this going like, you are driving people away. You're driving people away. And I actually told Amy, I said, you should, and then I moved on to Buddha Judge to tell him this, just yell at them. Just yell and say, this is insane. We're going to lose those people. Sanders was saying no private insurance at all. Every other country, developed country in the world, has universal health care. Some have single payer. They all have private insurance. And I thought this was nuts. And no one would go, this is nuts. Because were, there was always this feeling, and it started back in 2017 with what I have in the book, and the people who are rushing to, in, to back uh, Medicare for all then that Sanders was somehow not going to be the nominee in the end, and they wanted the support of his people. For some of them, it was the belief that he was not going to run at all, and so that they would be uh, essentially performing see. to see who would get his supporters. But then once the race started and Sanders is in, then it's still thinking, oh, maybe we can try to uh, appeal to Fudge his it. folks. And, but but this was the, the key of what Sanders did here, that, look, he believes in the policy of Medicare for all. He does. But they also made a political calculation, which is, I think, a very smart one for their purposes, that no one who signed on to Medicare for all, even if they were co-sponsoring the bill, would ever be as good or pure on it as he was. And so they were always saying, I'm with Bernie or I agree with Bernie with this tweak. And it was and to people who really cared about Medicare for all, they were 
uh, if you believe in that as the the thing that's motivating you, then you want to go to the person who's behind it, the architect of it, Medicare for all, Bernie Sanders. And even if, no matter what other attempt, whether it was Harris or Warren or, or all the people who tried to play with it, you didn't get any of it. And and uh, the other thing that was going on that I think is interesting and that I get into in the book a little bit is that Buttigieg, into the fall of 2019, his campaign did some polling that asked people what they thought Medicare for all was. And they found out that a lot of people thought Medicare for all was the public option, was the ability to get health insurance no matter what. Sure. Right. Uh, and so there was it was not Medicare for all is that's the only program, but Medicare, anybody can get health care. Right. And that's Judge comes up with this very, as I point out in the book, uh, he's a McKinsey guy. It's a very McKinsey phrase, Medicare for all who want it. But that is actually where the public was among the Democratic primary voters. This sense that's that, where we yeah. were as a except for Joe Lieberman. That's what we would have had. Right. We yeah. would have had the public option in in uh, when we passed the bill in 09. Yeah. And you see also, you know, to come back to Biden on this, he's the only one in those primary debates who was firm and not willing to talk about how he wanted Medicare for all in some way or another in any way, like a lot of the other candidates were doing. And he just said, we need to expand Obamacare, expand Obamacare. Now, seeing what that actually will be in practice is, of course, up in the air a little bit. But I, I think that that ended up making a a pretty important contrast for Biden that people could see that, the, the, you know, whether they could follow along with the particulars of the policy debate or not. And again, being paid, I was at every Democratic primary debate in person. I would sit there in the media room uh, watching the first 25, 30 minutes of these debates uh, with my head in my hands trying to stay uh, <laughs> awake uh, through it and, and trying to make sense of what they were saying. Yeah, but, and America was do- going through the same thing. Yeah. Now, I, 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 and I think you make this point too, that this was part of Elizabeth Warren's undoing. And one of the things that I did not understand why she didn't do this is she kept she would be asked, like, will there be tax increases to pay for this thing? Mm -hmm. And Bernie would say, yeah, there's going to be. Why she didn't come up with some number and say, yeah, including middle class people, will have to pay, I don't know, 2,000 more a year in taxes or three, whatever. But... You now pay seven thousand a year. An average family makes I don't know sixty five thousand dollars. Yep. On health insurance instead of so here here's uh, you know Jake Tapper. You've just asked me this question. I've brought some props. Yep. <laughs> here are seventy one hundred dollar bills, and here are twenty one hundred dollar bills. Now, would you like the twenty one hundred dollar bills or the seventy one hundred dollar bills? Because, yes, you're going to have to pay $2,000 more in taxes, but you don't have to pay the $7,000 that average families pay. So here's my question for you, Jake. Do you want this pile of hundreds or this pile of hundreds? Uh, I think that that probably would have been pretty effective. I I mean, I'll tell you, look, you've been on the uh, political side of it. I'll tell you from the reporter side of when there are things like this, and and it was the case for Warren, where everybody kind of knows where this where the situation is going to end. At some point, Warren was going to need to come out with an answer, a plan for Medicare for all. But she dragged it out over months and months for reporters. That's just that's the that's the pig and shit. Uh, situation, right? Because you get to keep asking the question and keep watching the candidate or the politician squirm in well, pig not and shit. Pigs, pigs love shit. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay. So, oh, so oh, I see. That's, you see what I'm I saying? That the we, reporters, we, we, reporters love yeah, the reporters love asking it because it, it, you're watching the politician you, squirm. You're you. watching them not answer. And why? I I will tell you, there are a lot of things that I cover where I wonder why they don't just. Like, why not just say it already? I I remember um, when there was the Charlie Hebdo shooting in uh, in Paris, and remember all the world leaders went except Obama didn't go and Biden didn't go, and it was a whole big thing that they walked arm in arm down the street. 
And I wrote an article back then uh, that just raised that this was a thing that the White House, the Obama White House, seemed to have missed, that they should have been part of that. And the at one, there were a lot of like angry phone calls back and forth about it. And uh, and then finally, Josh Ernest, who was on the White House press secretary, said, you know what? We made a mistake. We're sorry. We should have been there. And then it was done. It was over. Everybody moved right. on, right? And I you said to Ernest afterwards, that. why didn't you, why don't you just do that more often? It would be more, <laughs> so much more uh, useful for you guys to, when you make a mistake, just say, or, or when there's something, she was always going to have to re- put out a plan, which she eventually did at the end of October. But that was after months of being pummeled. It was for not also putting out a plan. kind of a crazy plan. That's true. But at least if she had put there's out that, that exact too. same thing, Four months earlier, I think the the arc of her campaign would probably have looked at least a little bit different. She made a few stumbles, uh, obviously, including uh, her heritage. Well, I mean, and that that was an example of them screwing up in a very similar way. In 2012, when she was running the first time against Scott Brown, these questions came up. They thought about doing a DNA test. She didn't do it. She, they decided they weren't going to fall into that. Then they decided in the fall of 2018, knowing she's about to launch a campaign for president, that they're going to do this whole big thing. They took her back to Oklahoma. She recorded a video with her family. Uh, she did the blood test. And they still, first of all, they bit on the Republican attacks on her and mostly the Trump attacks, uh, calling her Pocahontas and all this crazy stuff. Uh, By the way, I, I knew that her finance chair Mm-hmm. And at a certain point when I thought where Elizabeth may be uh, the nominee, I said, she should call him Polka Porn Star. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and this is a friend of mine. And my friend goes, oh, she's not. Uh, I don't. I go, come on. She calls him Polka Porn Star. She wins that round really big. And she could say, you know, I, you know, I, uh, I don't like to call people names. I could call him Polka Porn Star or Polka Playmate and pay her off or uh, Polka Woman on his wife while she's pregnant <laughs> or something like that. And and man, oh man, it would have been shoom. I mean, right up to the top. And they wouldn't. They, oh, she's not going to do that. I go, why not? I, I look between that and the the going on to the CNN set with Jake Tapper and stacks of hundred dollar bills. I mean, these are things that I think uh, one of the things that Democrats need to take away from the Trump years is how to talk to people where they are and how to make them connect with things. And uh, and and Biden does it in his own way, but you know, th- there's such a if you think that people are always going to just want the high-minded policy discussions, then you're going to find out that you lose. You lose elections, right? And and Trump, I, it was astounding to me. I can understand why a lot of Democrats didn't want to get down on exactly the level of Trump, but to not ever have any kind of a counterpunch uh, as most most of the people. Well, first the of all, did. Pocahontas was so offensive. Yeah, that she was that she. Perfectly legitimate for her to come back. Totally, I mean, it was completely racist, right? And and juvenile it's, and stupid and uh, all <laughs> every way that you could have gone at it. And, and yeah, I uh, I think she probably would have done better had she uh, had she had some kind of comeback, whether it was yours or something else. Polka porn star. Polka porn stars. I mean, there's a there's an alliteration <laughs> there which I like. <laughs> Duh. Hey, thanks for analyzing a joke. <laughs> Is this the kind of writing you do in the Atlantic? It's, it's, it's too many the years analysis? in Latin class. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to some of the other. Well, that was another thing is uh, the attacks uh, by some on others. Uh, the one you write about, of course, is Harris. Mm-hmm. I don't think you're a racist is a very weird friggin' thing. (laughs) I do not believe you are a racist. And I agree with you when you commit yourself to the importance of finding common ground. But I also believe, and it's personal, and I was actually very, it was hurtful, to hear you talk about the reputations of two 
United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. And it was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. I, I read in your thing that they were saying like, well, you know, there, it's going to bring up the question. It sounds like you're calling him a racist, so you should dispel with that. No, <laughs> no. Who thought of that? And what then the advisor <laughs> said that. And then there's the consultant that says it's like saying, I know you're not a child molester, but, you know, like you can't raise the issue and it not be there. And of course, that's what Biden and everybody around him heard from it. And that's why they were so pissed. Yeah. And also her stance on busing was exactly what his is. Right. She isn't for busing. <laughs> she isn't for mandatory busing now. And I don't understand why he didn't just turn around and go like, uh-huh. What's your stand on busing? Are you for mandatory busing right, right. now? Do you want, you want to force the people you and, know, I mean, look, in I, I, I Boston think it, the bus now? Is that what you want to do? Because tell me. Tell me. That would be interesting. The other part of it, and they, they were trying <laughs> like, to like make it out like this is an old issue that like Joe Biden was a senator when they were still talking about busing. But I'll tell you, look, I, I was born in 1980. Uh, so... Uh, oh, I, I, I even as a reporter who's done a, a couple of presidential, and they elections, allow you, they allow you to write. I know a... it's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Barely drink, um, but it all felt very remote to me. I remember sitting in Miami that night and thinking, like, we're really we're doing ten minutes on busing. How is that what the 2020 election is about? But it was this calculated play to try to take him down, and, and all these things that were going on. And ultimately, I mean, look, it worked out for her. She got picked for the ticket. She's the vice president of the United States. But I think it caused yeah. more of a problem for her than uh, – Oh, no, than, no, no. no. She benefit. went up and then right down. Yeah. I mean, took a little while for people to go like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> She's not for busing. <laughs> no one's for busing. No one's for mandatory federal busing. But but really, like uh, bus, uh, mandatory busing, what, that is not a thing that is a part of. It just seemed very strange. Okay, let's uh, let's now. Some some people just never got any elevation whatsoever, including Harris. Basically, right? Yeah. She had the other than that, she dropped out before Iowa, right? She dropped out right after Thanksgiving 2019. So yeah, before before she would have even been formally like printed onto a ballot. Uh, but yeah, she was she was out of it before there was any voting uh, anywhere close to beginning. Right, and uh, Bloomberg had his moment. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's uh, that's why that chapter in the book is called "A Billion Dollars for Samoa." Right, he spent over a billion bucks and came away with winning the primary in American Samoa, which I don't think was his great dream in life. Bloomberg, and I covered him when he was mayor, um, his completely over-the-top campaign spending can make a lot of difference in things and helped him win three uh, elections for mayor in New York. But I think in American Samoa that anybody was paying attention and that anybody was spending what was probably uh, a, like more money that had been spent on, I would guess, every presidential candidate in every presidential election to that point combined that probably gave him a leg up there um, but it, I see. it, it, but it he didn't, didn't get that many delegates no he did not go to samoa i i was with him go to, i gotta win somewhere i'm gonna fly to samoa <laughs> and spend a week there I, th there's a moment that we ended up cutting from the book uh because we were just uh tightening up on and some of the space stuff and, and so i'm at the airport with him in West Palm Beach uh, on the afternoon of Super Tuesday when it is clear to everybody that he is about to get crushed. And he's just standing there in this purple shirt on the tarmac looking up at the sky and contemplating clearly, not really a, a mode that I've seen Mike Bloomberg in a lot, obviously just thinking about it, what went wrong. And then he turns to somebody who worked for him and he said, are my clubs on the plane? <laughs> And they said, yes. Are my clubs on the plane? <laughs> We've got your golf clubs, sir. Um, they, they loaded them on um, so that he, uh, he, I guess he was thinking that he could go golfing in Florida the next day. Uh, he ended up flying back to New York in the middle of the night to, to drop out the, oh, the day after. Oh, but I wish, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Must be nice. Must be. That's what we say in Minnesota when you're uh, passive aggressive. Must be nice. <laughs> You I mean, were, yeah. <laughs> so your, your golf clubs are on the plane. He used to, his line Must when he was nice. running for mayor was, uh, 
my plan B is better than everybody else's plan A. And I guess when you have $60 billion to your name, that's true. Uh, he w obviously wanted to be president, but I think he's doing okay, even even not being president. <laughs> my plan B is to be worth $60 billion. <laughs> <laughs> What's your time. plan B, You've got Booker? Time. <laughs> <laughs> What's your... What's your plan B, uh, Yang <laughs> Bullock? I thought Bullock got screwed, and and I kind of have to blame Perez because he wasn't allowed in that first debate, and I thought Bullock was like an actual, you know, possible candidate, governor in a won a red state pretty handily in a. A year in which Trump had won uh, Montana by a large yep. margin, and and it just it, Bullock had just stayed in in Montana to do the, a session. He was yep. governor. He was doing his job, and his job was to make sure that uh, Medicaid expansion stayed in Montana. So he's doing a great thing. And friggin' he didn't raise the money because he didn't go out and raise money because he was being governor. And I thought, like, he was a, a, a real contender. I think he could have been. Could have been and and uh, a lot of people thought that, too. I'm not. I, I, you're right that if he had gotten into the debate, uh, that first debate, it, it might have helped him. Of course, there were 20 people between two nights on that first debate. Yeah. Uh, and it was hard for most of them to stick out. I don't know. I mean, like, Tim Ryan was in the first debate. Did that change his campaign trajectory? I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, so well, would that no, have, would but... that have been enough for Bullock? I think I I think there was he had a case to make, and he did never really get to make that case. He made it onto uh, the debate stage just once. He never kind of got past the idea that he got into the race late and it had already started without him. But I was out in Montana with him a couple days before he launched uh, in May of 2019. And whether it was seeing him in action there or seeing him work the Iowa State Fair later that summer, there was something there that seemed like it might have been able to catch and then it never it never caught. And I don't know if that's because, uh, again, not getting the spotlight or if it's because his, he just wasn't the right fit I, I for the year. not being yeah. in that batch just was bump. You're gone. It could have been. And again, like the report, you know, that's a that's a reporter thing, too. Right. A lot of reporters who said, OK, like we already have 20 candidates. You want us to take more candidates? In? Like there's only so much space in our brains. <laughs> right. There's only so much uh, so many stories that could be written. I mean, I remember when I went out to Montana, my editors and I wrote a big piece about him in the Atlantic. My editors were like, why? Why is this happening? Why are you going there? Why, like, why do we want another piece on another person running for president? And I tried to make the case uh, both to them and then with the, the article that ran that there was something to it. But uh, I think that that is the and I say this not to brag. It's, it's actually, you know, just a realistic assessment of what Bullock struggles were. I think that's one of the few articles that he had that was focused on him at all. He needed more of that. And they couldn't crack the code on how to make people accept that he was actually doing things to do his job, that he he really did think it would be worse for the people in Montana to not have Medicaid expanded and that he wouldn't have been able to get Medicaid expanded and a couple of other things that he wanted to do at the end of that session. And in Montana, they only uh, meet they don't meet hey, not for, for him not for him too much time on him <laughs> <laughs> poor well, steve bullock he can't him. he can't even get time yeah. now <laughs> now now okay let's talk about better aurora comes out of that uh texas senate campaign a star a huge yep. star uh what happened there because now i think he's reinvented himself in a really good way i think he wasn't quite ready to be running for president. I think he mm -hmm. had all the celebrity part of it um, and the appeal, but he had never thought through what it was going to be to run and the positions that he'd need to have. Um, he seemed yeah, he not serious. got to do that. Um, yeah. You know, like yep. when you, when you launch your presidential campaign after months of pushing back at basically every political reporter who had been trying to say it looked like he was getting ready to run for president. Instead, he launches with a, a an Annie Leibovitz cover shoot on Vanity Fair. That really encapsulated a lot 
of it to me. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and then he showed up. I remember he, uh, his first trip to Iowa. We were in Independence, Iowa, uh, the lovely town of Independence. And he had been in the race for, I think at that point, just over 24 hours. And there was this whole big thing. Are you going to release your first 24 hours of fundraising? Uh, and uh, all the reporters were crowded around him. And somebody was really pushing him on that. And he just said, look, I can't. I can't tell you that number. And I looked at him and I said, well, you could. You could I mean, if you know it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he said, he said, uh, Isaac, you're right. Uh, I could. Uh, but I, I choose not to. And it was just so weird. to like uh, That, that was very what, weird. Um, and, and But people were drawn to him in a big uh, I would way. have to have thought those that was actually a good number, too. And it was. In the end, it was. But there was something like he just wasn't. The, the the going from being the guy who's running against Ted Cruz that uh, <laughs> and I I don't think uh, I'm not saying this just because I'm talking to you I don't think anybody has captured the feelings about Ted Cruz better than you did <laughs> what's the lie that you, you like him more than anybody else in the Senate and and you hate Ted Cruz right um, well I I I. I liked him more than most of my colleagues <laughs> liked him, but I hated him. <laughs> well, I think that that's that that, that uh, hit on something very real about the feelings about Ted Cruz, and then there was I know, uh, but uh, he's senator, and uh, he still thinks he's in it, and he's I. I th- there's so many Ted's kind of a dick, and kind of is not the right modifier (laughs) but um there's a lot of stories that i'll be telling on the road (laughs) when i do my tour (laughs) uh let's move on to others that sort of didn't maybe well hickenlooper sort of flamed i don't know he he never uh, really flamed on so he didn't really flame out and then he ran for governor uh, for a senate yep. and, and good good for him so now now we're in the uh people who 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 actually got somewhere uh well booker yeah barely did well um, booker I, and you know through the book i trace the because i think that he's he's a confusing topic within the context of this race it so much seemed at every point in the race like he was about to take off and he never took off at all it seemed like he might be the right fit for what was going on uh, and and i would go to these events and whether it was the kind of cattle call uh, events that were 10 15 candidates one after another he would get usually the best or one of the best receptions in the room he would have hundreds of people show up to his events uh, in Iowa people who were really committed to him it seemed but then they would kind of wander off and not ever stay with him and i think maybe if the field had looked different he would have done better but maybe it was just that he uh he couldn't connect who he wanted to be with what the the feeling was on the world, right? That he he kept talking about how he wanted to love everyone and embrace everyone and love was what was going to bring us together. And that was not, like, Democrats were not in the mood for love in 2020. They were in the mood for fighting and for getting Trump the hell out of the White House. And I think that that ultimately uh, undercuts Booker a lot. And I talked to him at one point backstage after one of those multi-candidate events in Iowa where he had done well, but nobody cared. Uh, and the other thing that I think was going on with Booker is that he just realistically, a lot of people looked at him and they kind of said, well, we've already had a black guy. <laughs> and uh, I referred to that one point in uh, an article that I wrote as second order racism that was really working against him. Uh, and uh, look, there are a lot of people who ran who collapsed for all sorts of other reasons. Some of those were Booker's too. He could never raise the money. He could never really figure out how to get himself to have a good moment on a debate stage. He, it was a really, it, it, his candidacy should have worked by a lot of measures. And then it just didn't by any measure at all. Now, uh, you brought up Obama there. Yep. Um, it seems like you're a little critical of him in terms of not building the party while he was president, I think he would say, I was busy being president. I think you're right. And and he would say he had a lot of things to deal with, uh, a lot of big <laughs> crises um, that were uh, presented to him in 2008. Uh, that Biden used to say about him that everything landed on his desk except for locusts. And but you know, I think the other thing about Obama is he was never a party guy, right? He he mm-hmm. his whole rise 
is as the guy outside the party, whether it was in 2000 when he ran for the House against Bobby Rush, um, lost that race, obviously. 2004 in the Senate primary, he's not the person that most people thought would be the candidate uh, or wanted to be the candidate. He runs anyway. That was a really crazy Senate race in itself. And he ends up emerging from it uh, as... Uh, the by the time he gives his convention speech in 2004, everybody knew that he was going to walk away with that race. 2008, of course, runs against Hillary Clinton. She's got all the traditional Democratic Party support, uh, sure. and he wins anyway. So he, it's just not the way that he's wired, and he never really cared that much about right. it. But you do look at some of the numbers on this stuff, and it's hard to ignore what happened, which is that 900 plus state legislature seats that were held by Democrats when it was inaugurated were held by Republicans by the time he left the White House. The House and Senate were both Democratic majorities when he came in. They were both Republican majorities when he left. Most of the governors in the country, the majority of the governors in the country were Democrats when he came in. The majority were Republicans by the time he left. There are a lot of other things at play, including gerrymandering and everything that happened after 2010. Some of it is a backlash uh, to a black president that was there with the Tea Party wave. Mm -hmm. uh, Which and we didn't. We it, It's interesting because... I'd say like a lot of people went like, oh, we elected a black president. Thank God we're now past this. Yep. And the opposite kind of was true that and that that's what Trump tapped into. Yeah. We haven't talked about Trump in this, uh, which is he was a big part of this. election. <laughs> he was. He was. <laughs> yeah. So. Let's, but, but, you know, let's, the, let's... the thing about the black president, I think, you know, I, I, just the, the one of the lines that stuck with me is uh, Patton Oswalt had this joke after Clinton lost in, in 16 that he says, like, you know, in, in retrospect, I don't know why we were surprised. Like, it's a big thing for a black guy to be president. And then we wanted a woman to be president. That's like some people like bungee jumping and some people like. Uh, skydiving but like you never have somebody who like jumps out of the plane lands they're fine and then they say let's go bungee jumping right now right like it was just there was a <laughs> lot of craziness right? um, that, that people were expecting could be uh, just walked through here and, and I do think that Obama it obviously riled people up in a lot of the ways Hillary Clinton's candidacy riled people up in all sorts of different ways and together uh, it, it's it is almost inevitable that there would have been a backlash um, I'm not sure anybody would have guess that it would have come in the form of Donald Trump, but it did. It did. And a, a birther and someone who clearly, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying by any means that everybody who voted for Trump was racist, but every racist <laughs> voted for Trump, you know, and uh, he really appealed to that. And I just had George Packer on mm -hmm. and he kind of does a very kind of interesting analysis of how we got here. And, and, and part of that is the Tea Party and the resentment among, you know, whites and white working class, both resentment up and down, uh, up at the meritocracy, which is what, of course, uh, Hillary represented, I think, and then re resent, you know, racial against, against immigrants certainly mm -hmm. and against people of color so yeah that that's was something that i don't think people really appreciated until it was too late and boy is it too late and you know also the russians interfered and there was yeah other and all sorts thing, of things she right? would have like, won otherwise and She'd be president, and yeah. she'd be the have been the first woman president, and you know it would have been historic. And it was, she won by three million votes, and you know there the role that the Russians played, I think, and and Comey for goodness sakes, mm -hmm. Jesus. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's a lot, right? I just, and and I think you're right. I know right? we all go through this all the time. <laughs> no, but, it's well, like, like, uh, it's <laughs> when you think about it, with all of these things, and then it's like, what is it? A total of uh, seventy thousand votes, ninety thousand votes between Wisconsin. Uh, no, seventy, the, yeah. right? Um, that all, th then that would have given her the win, and and you know that's part of why the book starts right with uh, Obama and Biden watching Trump win on election night, which I got to tell you, I wrote in part because I thought I, I had found out these stories in the reporting and uh, how they were reacting to what was going on, and it was interesting because they never the stories had never been told before, but it was also that I, I think we're all still processing 
whether you supported Trump or not, but especially for people who didn't, like the, the trauma of Trump winning. And it was to, to tell the story through the two of them and, and how like even the people at the the top of politics were having trouble making sense of this. And there's like this moment when Obama is talking with a couple of his aides uh, with Ben Rhodes and, and Cody Keenan, his speechwriter, about the statement that he's going to put out congratulating Trump, the official statement at like three o'clock in the morning on election night. And then Obama dictates some words and then they say to him, so do you want to put in something about uh, reassuring our allies that things will be good. And Obama says, no, uh, I can't say that. I don't know that that's true, right? And, like, um, and that's where things were, like, as the election is called. How about uh, reassuring the American people? <laughs> nah, <laughs> nah, I can't do that. Well, and then, you know, I, nah. was, in the, I was at the Javits Center on election yeah. night. Oh, um, my Lord, and I, what I, a scene. That yeah, must have been. It, was, it was a mess. And I left at 10 o'clock at night about when it was closed clear that Michigan was going for Trump because I went back to Washington in the middle of the night to get to the White <laughs> oh, House. Jesus. Um, and so as I'm walking out of the Javits Center, I start emailing people who worked for Obama in the White House. And the subject line of the email was, do you have a plan? And I didn't include anything in the body of the email. And I, I sent a bunch of them out. I got one back. It just said, nope. Um, <laughs> <and then laughs> sh- sure enough, by the time that I'm in the Rose Garden <laughs> that afternoon after the election, uh, when Obama comes out and he says his line, like, uh, the, you know, the, the sun uh, elections uh, are lost, the sun comes up, you know, and he's trying to reassure people. And then I turned around and there are a couple of pictures that have been taken of this of uh, just the Rose Garden was packed with everybody who worked for the White House. And they all were just, they clearly all been crying. You could see it on their faces. And they some of them were crying watching it. Uh, just the, the, I don't, I don't think we're going to, all of us as a society, as maybe a planet, like, be able to fully appreciate what these last couple of years did for us, starting with that day of really like Donald Trump is really going to be the president. Oh, and, and then, then, and then it, it hasn't even peaked yet. Right. I mean, in other words, what happened was, and then it's bad, 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 bad. It's it, first day is I have the biggest crowd ever. Yeah. I had a bigger crowd than Obama. It's like, are you, are you crazy? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then, you know, but then. We go to uh, COVID, and he is the most irresponsible person you possibly could have had in that place. We have 600,000 Americans die, the most of any country in the world. Yeah. We, ha- we take the lead right away and just keep it. <laughs> and he was one. and just <laughs> turned it over to the states so that he could blame the states. I mean, I, Andy Slavitt has written this book called mm-hmm. Preventable. And, you know, he, he was talking to the Trump people, and it was clear that he just wanted to turn over the states so that when things screwed up, he could blame the states. It, it was criminal what he did. So then you think, okay, well, that's the worst thing in the world that could possibly happen. What happened was 600,000 Americans died and because this guy, and then this guy turned Americans against each other about don't wear the mask. I mean, it, it's on it just and then and then we have the election and he claims the election was stolen and he leads these people to go to the Capitol and we have an insurrection in the Capitol. And now 70 percent of his party believes the election was stolen and Republicans are passing laws in state legislatures to not just suppress votes, but to allow state legislatures or uh, partisan elected officials to overturn the results of elections. And so it's worse. It's gotten worse. The book was supposed to, my final uh, chapters were supposed to be turned into my editor the morning of January 4th. And I gave him everything except the final chapter. And I said, look, let me just see what happens this week. Account for the Georgia Senate races. Um, I, don't, I, don't make, I don't make predictions publicly, but I was making some to him. And I said to him, to my book editor, uh, I said, like, and then on Wednesday is the certification of the vote. And let's just like, it's going to be a lot of political theater, but we need to account for it. And also, hopefully, um, I had been talking with Biden's team about 
about doing an interview with him that they had said maybe it was going to happen the first week of January. And so my editor on Monday morning says, OK, that's fine. I got enough to read here. Just get me that last chapter uh, at the end of the week. Then I go to I was in Wilmington the day of the riot um, because I was trying to just cover it from Biden's perspective, not knowing that it would be the riot, but just knowing that it would be craziness. I was planning to drive back to Washington that night, but because they put the curfew in place, I didn't drive back and I stayed over in Wilmington and went back to Biden's second speech. He spoke the day of the riot a couple hours after it had started, and then he spoke again the next day. And as I'm walking in, my book editor uh, <laughs> sent me an email that said, yeah, so we're going to push the whole book back a couple of weeks because you're going to need to write through all of this. And I'm glad that I did. And in some ways, uh, look, uh, for as an American, I wish the riot hadn't happened. But as a, an author, I'm not glad that it happened, but it did sort of wrap up a lot of what was going on. It made real what we were all pretending just existed in Facebook and was just rantings. And who knows? You remember there was that stuff uh, when Trump was questioning the results like a week or two after the election. Oh, what does it harm anyone for him to he's, go on like this? He's just processing it. That, that argument was ridiculous then. And then you saw how <laughs> ridiculous it was. And I think we are all so, so lucky that it didn't get worse that it what that more people weren't killed that there weren't members of congress who were killed you know there's a story in the book from uh, Lisa Blunt Rochester the congresswoman from Delaware who told me she's in the uh, house chamber watching uh, the vote gets certified when the rioters start coming. She thinks she's going to die. She turns to Val Demings, uh, the congresswoman from Florida, and they are both thinking like pray to god and then she walks out of the chamber when they're evacuating them. And she is scared to have her pin on that identifies her as a member of the house because she thinks the rioters might kill her. But she is scared sure. to put it away because she's thinking, well, I'm a black woman walking around the Capitol. I might need police protection and I might not get it if they think I'm just a black woman and not a congresswoman. So she holds it in her hand, ready to show it, you know, like in a clenched fist. That's smart. A, that, but it's smart. But also that's an insane thought process that someone should have to have in the year. No, you have to game that out. You have to game that out these days. <laughs> <laughs> right. like, think about that right a black woman okay, walking around the capitol thinks that they might let me get killed unless i can show them this little piece of metal that says i'm a member of congress but i can't let too many people see it because then uh i might <laughs> I, I might get killed by the rioters and then you have like uh, cory booker who told me he's standing on the floor of the senate as the rioters come through and he you know he's a football player in college he's a big guy uh he looks around and he sees all these older senators <laughs> And he thinks I might have to fight to save these guys' lives, <laughs> right? Like that—that's what's going on. But that it—it it, I, the only and, and it's hard to call it a silver lining at all. The only thing that I think is like maybe for the ultimate benefit of us and uh, uh, what happened there is it—it it, there's just no ignoring what happened to a, a big part of this country because of Trump uh, and because of what he did to his uh, supporters and continues to do. And then it comes on all of us to figure out what we do about that. Well, thank God everything's falling into place now. Yeah, everything's fine. And, you know, it's been calm. And, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. This has been fun. Congratulations on the book. Thank Battle you. for the soul. And uh, it's really a fun read. And, uh, you know, I'm... If you're, especially if you're a political junk, you have to say, and we, we try not to encourage that. <laughs> um, here, here, we try to do some, you know, public policy and not do the day to day politics. But every once in a while, if you want to just devour the, like what happened during the 2020 race, this is a, a great way to do it. Battle uh, for the soul. And uh, it's great beach read. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> uh, <clears throat> but. Thanks for having me. This is great. <laughs> Thanks for being on. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. <laughs>